Hello, my name is Carrie Allen and I am a pharmacist with Omnicare. I'm here to present to you today part two of our three part series on medication pass fundamentals. We have a lot of information on these slides and it's mainly for your reference and a way for you to print them out is to look right above the screen. There's a little paper clip icon. You can click on that. Another little window will pop up and anything we have that is available for you to print out will be available. You can just click on it and you can print it right from your computer. Another way that we have tried to make this easier for you is we've chaptered different topics. So if you need to rush through quickly, find a very specific topic, we've allowed you to do that. And how you do that is you click on the slide list button. Looks to me like kind of a window pane window. And then you click on the chapters button. It'll list the chapters. You click on the one that you want to click on and it will show a screen and you'll be able to get back to that picture of me talking and the slides by the third step on the slide I'm showing you right now. The intended audience for this presentation is any facility or community setting that has medication pass as part of their services. So an assisted living facility, a skilled nursing facility, anything like that. I will refer a fair amount to regulations and information from the state operations manual or skilled nursing facility regulations. However, you can get a great amount out of this as an assisted living facility or any other type of facility because these are the lowest minimum standards and they're common sense things that can help you reduce medication errors in any facility. It's great for clinical and non non-clinical management, so perhaps the director of nursing or assistant director of nursing, but even the administrator can get something out of this. People who are performing med pass every day, your LVNs, LPNs, registered nurses, med aides, med technicians if they practice in your state, and any staff that may require an annual refresher, an occasional refresher, or retraining secondary to a medication error. And finally, facilities who have been permitted by their state governing body to use the training as part of a plan of correction. We're going to go over the medica medication pass basics and getting started. The seven rights, if you don't think there's seven, I think there's seven. We'll go through that. How to do a three-way check before you give medications. How to prepare and administer oral, ophthalmic, otic, and nasal medications. And some common things that are going to trip you up or mishaps or errors. So how to begin? We're going to go over general processes for how all medications should be passed, so some general rules. First and foremost, have all of your materials ready to go, and we covered that in part one of this three-part series. So how do you begin? First and foremost, you need to know what goes on at your facility, your facilities, policies, their procedures, and any applicable state laws or federal guidelines, and you need to know where to find these. Sometimes people keep the facility policies locked up in a room somewhere, and that's okay, but everybody at the facility needs to know what's expected of them and how we work our day-to-day -day processes, especially in relation to medication pass. When you're passing medications, you need to look at the medication administration record and make sure those orders are current. You never ever go by memory or just by looking at the medication label or cards. Check for allergies every time you pass medications. Sometimes new allergies develop, sometimes you get new medications that are prescribed and the doctor didn't realize someone had an allergy. Sometimes there's drop-offs. I had a computer update at one of the facilities I work at and the entire wing on one side, all of the allergies dropped off. And as we know, you never pass medications unless you're sure if someone has an allergy. Any allergy that is documented in the chart or on the MAR is considered real until proven and documented otherwise by a physician. Here's just a little cycle that you should go through as you pass medications all the way through. So first you need to recall all of the administration techniques. Oh, I'm going to need to do this, this, and this. What are the supplies I need to have for that? Do I remember how to do that? Verify your orders are correct and look for new or changed orders. You never know. You go to lunch, you come back, an order may have been changed. 
Make sure you have the meds on the cart and make sure you have a should not crush list and a med storage list handy. Before you do anything, check the resident's availability and readiness to take the medications before you prepare them. I've seen people beautifully prepare medications, do everything correct. They go to give the medication. The resident's out on pass with family having breakfast or in therapy, and we don't want to interrupt them during physical therapy. And now this person is stuck with this cup of medications, and they don't know what to do because I am watching them, and you shouldn't just be sticking a cup of meds in your cart. So that puts you in a bad position. Check with the resident. Check with the therapy team. Coordinate with people and say, hey, you know, before you take people for a shower to this and that, I'm going to give Mrs. Jones her med. Mrs. Jones, please wait for me right here in your room. I'm going to be right back with your medication. Get it coordinated. Remember privacy and dignity. So we don't interrupt meals. We don't interrupt bingo, anything like that. If you have orders to interrupt meals, make sure it's absolutely necessary. A lot of those medications that can be given with meals could be given right after a meal. Some should be given exactly with meals, but not as many as you might think. Don't bring the cart into the dining area under any circumstances. And please don't perform any blood sugar checks or administer medications in common areas like nasal sprays, eye drops, ear drops, those kind of things. Make sure that you do not pre-pour medications. You prepare them immediately before you give them to someone. What I've got a picture of on this slide is something that I did wrong as a pharmacist. This was in my own home. I had an over-the-counter topical to help with a rash that I had on my skin. It's expensive and I thought, oh, you know what? I want to keep it. So I just put it in the little medication cup there. I came back, I picked up the cup, and there was all this white ooze on my black countertop there you can see. And what you can also see is that there's a hole in the bottom of the cup. I have a Q-tip pushing, pushing through that to show you. The medicine ate all the way through the cup. And that is a total amount of white plastic goo that got dissolved by this medication. This medication, by the way, which I'm supposed to be putting on my skin. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the medication or I can't put it on my skin. It means I stored it in a place that it shouldn't have been stored and it interacted with the materials of the cup in a way that I should have been able to predict, but I didn't. You never know when this is going to happen to you. So don't pre-pour medications. Store them as they're supposed to be stored. Prepare them right before administration. That's going to help you make sure that nothing like this happens to you, but also that you don't make medication errors. Only administer medications that you have personally prepared yourself. No one else prepares your medications and then tells you to go give them. You prepare them yourself. It's the only way to do the proper checks, and we'll go into that in a minute. Only use medications specifically intended for the resident you are treating. No borrowing. Make sure you're looking at those doses, okay? There's a proper expiration date. They're not discolored. If you're going to waste a controlled substance, maybe it fell on the floor or the resident spit it out, it needs to be destroyed with another appropriate observer, and you both need to sign and document per your facility policies and state and federal laws. Wash your hands. I can't say that enough. With soap and water before you start any of your med pass processes and then after you've completed them as a whole, you again use soap and water. You also should wash your hands with soap and water or use hand sanitizer between residents as appropriate and even during an individual med pass if you contaminate things. Remember that hand sanitizer should be alcohol based and it should be allowed to dry after you use it. You're not going to just pump it out have wet hands and go do what you need to do. It needs to dry so that it's effective. It also does not kill the intestinal infection, Clostridium difficile. You might know it better as C. diff. You absolutely have to use contact precautions and use soap and water to kill that. And you don't want to spread that in the facility, and you sure don't want to get it yourself, let me tell you. Vital signs. We have to monitor things associated with medications, you know, and typically you can use the ones within about an hour of the time that you're giving the medication, but that's not always true. So make sure that you're checking the specific manufacturer's recommendations, policies and procedures, those sort of things. Make sure you're monitoring things that make sense. If you're giving a food and if you're giving a foot medication, then, you know, you don't want to monitor probably if they're having high blood pressure in most cases. Those things don't correlate. 
are these vitals in the desired range? If they're above or below the specific target, do you know what to do and are you going to do it? Some medications require very specific monitoring. So, for example, digoxin requires an apical pulse versus the pulse that you would take for other medications. If someone's on an anticoagulant like warfarin or maybe Lovenox, make sure you're always, every time you look at them, looking for signs and symptoms of bleeding. And more generally, is the resident behaving normally? If they're not, you've got to look for medications or illnesses or situations that could be causing these issues, and you have to address them. So, when you're going to prepare medication doses, there's something called a three-way check. And this varies from person to person how they exactly describe it. But this is, generally speaking, how it goes. You have a medication. It could be any medication. It could be a liquid, solid, whatever. I'm using a blister pack. You look at the resident's name on the blister pack. You compare it to your medication administration record, okay? You check the resident's name the drug name, the dosage form, the strength, the concentration, the dose, the administration route, how often you're supposed to give it, the duration, especially if it's an antibiotic. If it's supposed to be given indefinitely, it needs to actually say indefinitely. Most of the time, it's 14 days, something like that, and the time it's supposed to be given. So if there's a discrepancy here right now, I stop. I can't do anything. I've got to go check and take action. I should review the order in the chart, check with my supervisor, call the physician, call the, call the pharmacy if needed, and don't give the medication until you know that order has been corrected and it's also corrected on the medication administration record. So if that's all right, I take the medication and I pop it, I prepare it. As I do that, I'm still making sure I've got the MAR, I've got the label, the medication looks right, it matches this, that's good. Number three, before I put this medication back in the cart where it came from and before I give it to the resident, I check again. If I go to do it and for some reason I get that gut feeling, you know, the gut feeling I'm talking about and you think something's not right, you need to trust your gut, okay? It's not going to hurt you to check some more. Every time I have not trusted my gut, I have regretted it. How to begin, you enter the room and you prepare the residence. You have to identify yourself. You knock on the door. This is where they live. You've got to be polite. Explain why you're there. Mrs. Jones, this is Carrie. I'm here to give you your medications. If the resident likes to hold the medications in their hands, some of them like to take the yellow pill first and count how many they have and make sure they have the seven that they take in the morning, do them a favor. Wash their hand off before you let them put the medications in their hand. You don't know where their hand's been. Explain what the meds are, why you're giving them. Make sure the resident's correctly positioned. You don't want them to choke. And if you have to set anything down on a bedside table or anywhere in the facility in that room, have paper towels, napkins, tissues handy. These will save you. You set the clean one down, you put the medication over the medication cup on it, and that is better. Remember the seven rights. You've got the right person. You need to look at the picture. Hopefully they have a picture for you in the MAR. And you also need to verbally identify the person. So, looks like Mrs. Jones. Are they answering to Mrs. Jones? Sometimes they don't know if they're Mrs. Jones. And if they're new to you, you need to get someone else who knows Mrs. Jones to check with you. All right? If we're using pictures to identify people in the MAR, make sure that your facility updates them. People don't always look like they look on the picture from when they first got to the facility. All right? And, you know, you've got people with the same name in the same room, a lot of different people in the same room, lots of things to check to make sure you've got the right person, and that's super important. You may not think of this, but the right reason. If you're not giving the medication for the right reason, it's the wrong drug. And also, you're not going to know what to monitor and when. You're not going to know what's important about that medication. The right time. We talked about that a little bit in the first video. The right drug, if someone's got an allergy for it, it's not the right drug. Right dose, right route. And I bet you thought I was going to go right to the right documentation. But before you get out of that room and pick up your pen and touch your med cart and touch your mar, you got to have clean hands. So wash your hands with soap and water preferably and or you could use hand sanitizer. Now the right documentation. You document the medication was given after giving it, but before going on to the next person. You do not give all the medications that you give during your shift, and at the end of your shift, 
rush down and initial everything. That is a recipe for error. It's improper documentation. It could, in some cases, if you're not doing it right, be falsification of medical records. So you don't want to do that. You should always observe and document if the resident has any ill effects from the medications, and you need to report this, okay? Record the results of as-needed medications as well, especially with pain medications or medications for constipation. You don't want to wait until someone's got a fecal impaction. You need to monitor and make sure things that are supposed to be happening are happening. You document and communicate to the next shift if a response is still pending, and then it's up to them. They need to pick up the ball and document if something happens, if you give a PRN documentation. Now, related to this, not PRNs, but documentation in general, if you're in the middle of preparing meds and then you realize you're making a mistake, you're missing a dose, you don't stop with the missing dose. You prepare all the medications that are due at that time and the ones you've already prepared, you get those ready and you give them to the resident. Then you investigate find out what happened, where the medication is, and get it, or you can ask someone else for assistance to help you investigate and get the medication to you. Don't forget about the emergency kit, the e-kit. You can use that if you need to. If you skip a dose for a resident, make sure you have a HIPAA-compliant process to remind yourself, like flag the MAR in a way where nobody can see anything but that you know you need to go back to that. Return to them as soon as possible, but if there's irregularities and you're not going to give that medication, make sure you document it. So document omitted doses and why you did it. So if you go down this picture I have of Amar, you see on the 11th, those are my initials, I have them circled. On the back of that paper Amar, I would write the time, the medication, why it wasn't given, and if I notified anybody about that. I notified the doctor, I notified the nurse if I'm a medic, one of those kind of things. If you have computers, then there's a a process for you to follow within the computer to document these same sorts of things. Route specific concerns, I'm not going to go through every detail on these slides. There's a lot of detail on these slides and, and you know what you're doing by and large. As a pharmacist who watches MedPass, what I want to do is point out the pitfalls, the common errors, some things that you should think about, those kind of things. If you need more information, Obviously, it's on the slides. You can print those out. Also on OmniView, our customer service site, we have policies and procedures for the skilled nursing facilities, for assisted living facilities, and even sample medication administration policies for you. There's also a lot of other information that Omnicare has available to you regarding medication path, and you can ask your consultant pharmacist about how to get that information. So oral medications, I cannot say this enough, hand hygiene before, during, as needed, and after passing medications. Do not pop pills or pour liquids while you're standing over the open med cart drawer. A lot of people open the cart, pull out the medications, have the cup, and then just start popping them right there. Well, this is a recipe for me to just start accidentally dropping meds in the med cart, and that's a problem. I've seen it, and it's funny now, it was not funny at the time, where someone had some codeine cough syrup, they were pouring it over the cart, they got bumped. That codeine cough syrup, which is a controlled substance, went all over the inside of the cart. We spilled a huge volume of it. It got all, all over everybody's blister packs. Documenting the controlled substance waste on that was a nightmare. Cleaning up those cards in the med cart was an even bigger nightmare because it destroyed all the labels. It takes two seconds to close that drawer. Do everything on the top of the med cart where you have a nice flat surface. If you accidentally pop a pill and or one just kind of falls out of the blister pack, as sometimes they do, you do not put it back in and use tape to put it back in. How sanitary was that? That wasn't sanitary and you're not licensed to package medications. You waste it. And if you need to, if it's a controlled substance, you document waste as appropriate. Keep gloves handy if a pill must be touched. Sometimes with those blister packs, you get the kind that are super hard to pop out and you think to myself, I'm never going to make it into this medication cup. It's going to go all over. In that case, you know, use a glove, but you're going to have to use a new glove for each one. You're going to keep it clean. Pop it, put it in the cup, make sure everything's nice and sterile. 
use gloves to open capsules. What I hear nurses say is, well, I'm not touching the part that goes into their mouth, so I don't need to use gloves. You do need to use gloves. Only open capsules that are allowed to be open. If you don't know what those are, and you know, it's not always obvious, and sometimes package inserts change. Symbolt is a really good example of that. Go to our OmniView site, to the Geriatric Pharmaceutical Care Guidelines under Clinical Tools, and we have common oral dosage forms that should not be crushed. On this list are also capsules that should not be open. So that's a handy reference for you that you can print out. It's a PDF document. If a pill drops on or in the cart or on the floor or in the trash, even the top of the cart, even if you accidentally pop it or intentionally pop it into your hand, okay, this is no longer usable. It's contaminated. You have no idea where my hands have been. You're not putting this in someone's mouth. So you need to throw it away. That was not proper disposal, but you're going to properly dispose it. Don't touch the inner surface of the med cup or the rim of the med cup, because this goes sometimes in someone's mouth. This is contamination, or even the beverage cup. If you went to a restaurant and the waitress came up to you and gave you your drink to drink like this, would you want to drink it? Because I wouldn't, okay? That's contamination. So you discard it and you get a new one. If it's allowable in your state and facility to split pills, use gloves and a pill cutter and never split tablets that aren't scored. I've got a picture of a scored tablet on here just in case you don't have a familiar reference for that. If you have an order to crush medications, use a pill crusher or a mortar and pestle. Crush those into a fine powder and mix in applesauce or other item. You might use water or applesauce, or I'm sorry, apple juice for enteral tubes. Just so you know, not all medications that are scored can be crushed. An example of this is Toprol XL, which is also known as metoprolol succinate. It has a score. So you'd think, okay, well, why can't I crush it? Well, it has little itty-bitty time-release pills. And the thought is the surface area that you cut right there where it's scored is going to release a little medication immediately. But it's not going to be enough to cause harm, whereas if you crushed it, the whole thing's released immediately, and that could cause harm. If you're using a mortar and pestle, and actually if you don't know what one looks like because it is sort of an old-fashioned thing to do, this is a mortar and pestle. So you use it to crush medications into the fine powder and pour them into the cup. Every time you use it, you clean it after use. When you're preparing oral medications, be sure, especially if it's a liquid and it's a suspension, you shake it so that all the dose is given and it's an accurate dose. We had a case with a girl who had seizures, horrible seizures, and she had a suspension seizure medication. She started having a lot of seizures. We couldn't figure out why. We couldn't figure out why. It turns out no one on any shift, nurses, med aides, med technicians, what have you, was really shaking the medication despite the fact that it had a shake sticker on it. And so she wasn't getting the medication. She was having seizures. This is a really terrible thing to have happen to you. Make sure that you pour the liquids into a graduated cup. And you, you may not be able to see this, but a graduated cup has the little measurements on it that tells you what you're pouring. You need to put it on a flat surface. You're not going to hold it up at eye level and pour your medication. It needs to be on a flat surface. You're going to look down at eye level and make sure that meniscus, that dip down, is right on the line where you want it to be, and that's the amount of medication you're going to give. Don't pour any excess liquid back into the bottle that's contaminated now. Discard it properly, okay? That's an important thing to know. You're going to pour the liquids with the label facing you. So if this were a you know, pharmacy label, or even if it wasn't, the label faces me so that I know, um, this is part two of my double check, right? I, or my triple check, I'm pouring the medication, and I know I'm pouring Maalox because I can see I'm pouring Maalox. Another reason is, is when I tip it back up, some solution may come down onto the bottle. I don't want it to go onto the label part that I read. And when you need to wipe this up, you probably have to use something damp. You're going to not contaminate the lid and the top. You're going to wipe down from the top and away from the label to keep it clean. That's how you do it. If you have thick liquids, you can dilute those with water. Some liquids absolutely have to be diluted with water for safety. A really good example is potassium liquid. 
Again, don't touch the rim or inside of a med cup or drinking glass as you're assisting residents. Do encourage water, but don't force them to take water by tipping up the cup or hurrying them along. Residents with COPD are going to take longer. They can't breathe as well. They can't coordinate this, but they still need the fluids in order for the medication to absorb well, in order for it to dissolve well, and because many of these people are dehydrated. You're going to have to watch the resident take the entire dose of the medication even if it's Miralax, in eight ounces of water. That might take a while, so your time management's going to come in here. Make sure all the meds are given. There's none sticking around in the cup. A really good way to make sure that nothing's stuck in the cup is after you crush a medication, you put the applesauce or whatever you're going to use putting in the cup first. Then you put the powder on top of it, and mix it, because it's hard to get the little powder granules out of the corner there. That can be a problem, okay? If the resident is vomiting, obviously we don't want to continue giving them medications. We need to report the issue to the physician, and maybe they're going to say, hey, give it by another route. Or maybe they're going to prescribe a medication to stop them from vomiting. And just as a note, this is another good reason why you give each medicine individually, so then you know, okay, they may have gotten part of this, they threw this up, they didn't touch this. When you're passing oral medications, there's some odd dosage forms out there. There's nitroglycerin spray, and you can put that on the tongue or under the tongue. There's buccal tablets, so those go in the cheeks, either up here or down there. Orally disintegrating tablets. You put them on the tongue, and you allow them to dissolve before the person swallows them. And with these buccal sublingual oral disintegrating tablets, we don't cut them, we don't chew them, and we don't crush them, and generally we don't swallow them whole. Some common errors, and this little guy, if you haven't seen him in any of the other presentations we've done, is a little guy getting tripped up over common errors. If you need to skip through this presentation and just figure out the common errors associated with each way to pass medications, you just look for this guy. He's there for you. So with oral medications, if you leave a lot of crushed medication particles in the cup, you're, you're not giving the whole dose, so that's an error. If you're crushing a should not crush medication without a physician's order, if you're failing to position the resident so that they don't choke, and of course, if you're failing to demonstrate proper infection control techniques. Some other popular errors are omission of doses, and you're more likely to do an omission of dose if you do the thing I told you not to do with documentation, whereby you wait to the end of your shift and you just sign off that you gave all the doses. Incorrect doses, we, just, we give the wrong one or we give the wrong one to the wrong resident. Resident chews or swallows things they're not supposed to chew. And medications such as potassium or bulk laxatives like Metamucil or NSAIDs like ibuprofen aren't given with adequate fluids. You want to give them with a lot of fluids and or food. Other medications, you need to be having the resident sit up so that their esophagus doesn't get eroded by the medication. Potassium is a good example of that. Another one is bisphosphonates. Those are the oral tablets that you're taking and the resident has to sit upright and drink a full glass of water and they can't have eaten. Well, the reason they have to sit upright is because it can cause erosion and ulceration of the esophagus. They're fairly corrosive. Eye drops and ointments. Well, you have to know which eye to put them in. That makes sense. Have the resident in a private location. People just do these all over the place, and that's not appropriate. Have them positioned correctly. Make sure you've washed your hands. If you're using a suspension, remember to shake it. If you have a cap, remember when you remove caps, you have gloves on and you are not touching anything. So my hands aren't all over this. They're up at the top. And you're going to place it threads up. And I have a picture of this on the slide. If it is threads down like this on an unclean surface, that's inappropriate. You want to put it up like so. Now, some of these things are so rounded at the top, or maybe if you have an eye ointment, it's impossible to get that to sit up. That's when your paper towels come in handy. Don't forget to bring those. They will save you with infection control. Obviously, there's the procedure where you're trying to expose the conjunctival sac. Some people call that making a pocket. So you want to make sure that you get that medication in there without touching the eyelashes, the eyelid, or anything like that. And that's just something that you need a little practice with and you'll get good at. The drops, you have to count them as they're administered, and that can be a little tricky. You know, some of them just sort of 
leak out, and so that's sort of hard to count. But you're going to learn to be careful if you practice things over and over again the correct way. The wait time between eye drops is pretty critical. So between the same medication, they say three to five minutes. Between different medications, it's generally five minutes, but you're going to need to check manufacturer's instructions because we got some that are 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or don't do it after this, or don't do it after that. Ask your pharmacist about that too. Now we've got some baby boomers coming in. These people are progressive. They may have contact lenses. There's a whole other set of issues and wait times associated with contact lenses. This is just a very busy slide that has a direct quote from the state operations manual for surveyors. It's guidance to them when they're at skilled nursing facilities. If you're not at a skilled nursing facility, this information is still useful to you because it's just the best practice on how to, or at least the minimal best practice on how to give an eye drop. The important point about this is absorption. Some medications need to be absorbed into the eye to work. We're talking about meds for glaucoma. We're talking about antibiotic medications, those kind of things, all right? And in those cases, you know, you really want the eye drop to wash over the eye and have contact for about three to five minutes. However, there's another aspect to this with regard to absorption. Some glaucoma medications, like Timolol, can have systemic effects, meaning that they're going to lower the blood pressure in the eye, but they're going to lower the blood pressure everywhere else. So while we want it to absorb, we don't want it to absorb too much. The state operations manual and some of the manufacturers feel that you can reduce this by pressing the tear duct for about one minute, so this punctal pressure like that, or by gentle eye closing for approximately three to five minutes. So you need to know which require absorption, which don't, and you should have guidance to that effect on the MAR. That's really going to help you the best. But things like natural tears, we're not really worried about absorption as much as we are just wetting the eye. Ointments, you know, you just apply your thin ribbon of ointments, and then you're going to twist the tube to cut off the ribbon. And then when I put this back on, I'm going to get a bunch of view on it. I'm going to need to wipe that off just like I would wipe a suspension away from the top and away from the label. Now remember, common sense, okay? Use your common sense. Ointments are going to blur vision. So if we only give them once a day, let's try to give them at night. If you can't give them at night, make sure that resident can see or they have some assistance if they're going to go be doing activities or those kind of things. This is the last thing we want to do is give them an ointment to help their eye and then have them fall down and break a hip, okay? That's not appropriate. Ear drops. All right, still in a private location. They're going to have to have their ear up that you're going to put the eye drop or the ear drop in. And that's super important. Wash your hands and put on gloves. I don't know why people forget this with ear drops, but they do. Same things apply with shaking and threads up and all of those things. You're going to gently pull up and back on the earlobe for an adult so you can make a straight canal to get in there. Put the ear drops in. But before you put the ear drops in, they can be cold. It's my recommendation you say, hey, I'm about to give you an ear drop because then the resident might jerk and you've contaminated the top without even intending to. That resident should lay down for maybe 5 to 15 minutes, and if the doctor says it's okay, you put a cotton ball in. For some things, you want it to evaporate, so you don't want a cotton ball, so you're going to have to check that out. Wash your hands. Wash your hands and change gloves in between ears if both ears require medication. And really the same thing goes for eyes in a lot of cases, especially with eye infections. Nasal drops, sprays, and aerosol. You may not have thought of this, but you need an emesis basin or a cup present so that the resident can spit if the nasal drop is dripping down the back of their throat. Obviously, you want to wash your hands and put on gloves. And I say obviously, even though I've seen people not do this all over the place. You're putting stuff in people's nose. That's pretty gross. You should be wearing gloves. Make sure the resident blows their nose and that you tell them, even if you're going to give them a tissue because things drop out, that they're not to blow their nose again for another about 15 minutes because we need that medication to get absorbed. When you're doing the drops, you know, the resident has to have the head tilted back and all of those things. Make sure that you're cleaning the dropper. you got to clean it. It's going in people's nose. Dry it and then recap. With sprays, you know, the resident's not necessarily lying down. They're sitting up. 
same basic procedure. And if you have to repeat, you're going to wait about one minute or more if more than one spray is ordered. Make sure you wipe that adapter tip and repeat the process on the other side if needed, and you may need to change gloves again and wash your hands. Some medications, like neocalcin, calcitonin nasal spray, are only given in one nostril. So you give it in one nostril on Monday, you give it in the next nostril on Tuesday. So you should be aware of those medications and make sure you're documenting and doing it correctly. With aerosols, you know, they just get in there a little faster, but it's the same thing. They, they have little medication cartridges. It's, you need to wash those adapters in lukewarm water and dry them before you put them away. And of course, make sure that you've got good hand hygiene. For eye, ear, and nose medications, the things that are going to trip you up, there's our little tripping up guy. Incorrect positioning of the resident. Forgetting a dose. So even you know, if there's two sprays and you only gave one, that's omission of a dose, technically. The incorrect dose, if you gave two sprays and you're only supposed to give one, or you gave that calcitonin nasal spray in both nostrils, okay? Those sort of things. Failure to shake the suspension up. Improper storage of medications or using expired medications. A really good example of this is Zalatan or Latanoprost. It's meant to be kept in the refrigerator. And if you open it, or if you store it not in the refrigerator, or you do both of those things, it's only good for 42 days. And people forget to date it. They forget to check the date after it's already been dated, and bam, we're using an expired medication in someone's eye. That's not a good thing to do. You have to use gloves. You have to wash hands. If you touch the tip of the applicator to the body, you have to deal with that. You need to clean things. You need to clean your hands, all those things. Placing that cap threads down on an unclean surface. That's, again, where those paper towels and napkins and everything come in. In residents, privacy or dignity. And it's not just the resident that you're giving the medication to. It's everyone. Other people live there. If I'm at a dinner table and I live at one of these facilities or I'm just visiting at one of these facilities and you're coming in and giving someone a nasal spray across from me, I'm going to think that's disgusting. I don't want to eat here. As mentioned in part one of this three-part series, it's recommended that clinical management consistently review MedPass techniques with current and new staff themselves as part of an internal quality assurance measure. And when you keep it internal, you all review it amongst yourselves, and this helps you ensure competency. The best way to do it is really to have a schedule, so you break it down maybe month by month. There's a really good example on this slide of how to do that, and what I like about it is, okay, January we're going over eye drops and eye ointment, but what else are we going over? We're also going over how you document that and the policies and procedures of the facility. You, your staff has to know what you expect of them and what's correct and what isn't correct. And I find that that's where facilities fall down. So this is a really great way to do it. Then in February, you notice, hey, it's all about blood glucose monitoring. And we go over that documentation and the policy and procedure. Also, as mentioned in the first video, don't forget to lead by walking around. Do some of the formal or the informal observation and some of the coaching on all of the med pass irregularities you observe on a day-to-day -day basis if you are in clinical management, or even if you're working with a coworker, so you can all stay on task. These are some of the resources that were used during this presentation. I want to thank you so much for your attention and your time. And again, my name is Carrie Allen, and we from Omnicare want to offer